Chapter 1. Politics versus Statecraft Libertarian municipalism is one of many political theories that concern themselves with the principles and practices of democracy. In contrast to most such theories, however, it does not accept the conventional notion that the state and governmental systems typical of Western countries today are truly democracies. On the contrary, it considers them republican states with pretensions of being democratic. Republican states, to be sure, are more democratic than other kinds of states, like monarchies and dictatorships, in that they contain various kinds of representative institutions. But they are nonetheless states, overarching structures of domination, in which a few people rule over the great majority. A state, by its very nature, is structurally and professionally separated from the general population. In fact, it is set over and above ordinary men and women. It exercises power over them, making decisions that affect their lives. Its power in the last instance rests on violence, over whose legal use the state has a monopoly, in the form of its armies and police forces. In a structure where power is distributed so unevenly, democracy is impossible. Far from embodying rule by the people, even a republican state is incompatible with popular rule. Libertarian municipalism advances a kind of democracy, by contrast, that is no mere fig leaf for state rule. The democracy it advances is direct democracy, in which citizens in communities manage their own affairs through face-to-face -face processes of deliberation and decision-making, rather than have the state do it for them. In contrast to theories of representative democracy, libertarian municipalism makes a sharp distinction between politics and statecraft. In conventional use, to be sure, these concepts are nearly synonymous. Politics as we normally think of it, is an essential component of representative systems of government. It is the set of procedures and practices by which the people choose a small group of individuals, politicians, to speak for them and represent them in a legislative or executive body. These politicians, in politics as we know it, are affiliated with political parties, which are supposed to be associations of people who share a commitment to a particular political agenda or philosophy. The politicians who belong to a party, in theory, speak for its agenda and advance its philosophy. As an election for governmental office approaches, various parties put forth politicians as candidates and, assisted by many consultants, wage electoral campaigns to try to persuade citizens to vote for them. Each party touts its own candidate's suitability for office and disparages that of its rivals. During the campaign, the candidates express their respective positions on the important issues of the day, which clarifies their differences in order that voters may grasp the full range of choices that they have. Hopefully, after carefully weighing the issues and soberly judging the positions of each candidate, the voters who have now become an electorate, make their choice. The contenders, whose positions accord most fully with those of the majority, are rewarded by being granted the office they covet. Upon entering the corridors of government, such is the belief that these new office holders will labour tirelessly on behalf of those who voted for them, who by now have gained yet another appellation, constituents. Scrupulously, they adhere to the commitments they avowed during their electoral campaigns, or so we are told. Indeed, as they cast their votes on legislation or otherwise make decisions, their primary loyalty is allegedly to the position supported by their constituents. As a result, when a piece of legislation or an executive order or any type of action is taken, it reflects the will of the majority of citizens. It should be clear to any sensate reader that this sketch is a civics class illusion and that it is democratic that its democratic nature is chimerical. Far from embodying the will of the people, 
politicians are actually professionals, whose career interests lie in obtaining power precisely through elected, being elected or appointed to higher office. Their electoral campaigns, which only partly or even trivially reflect the concerns of ordinary men and women, more often use the mass media to sway and manipulate their concerns, or even generate spurious concerns as distractions. The manipulative nature of this system has been particularly agrarious in recent US elections, where, financed by big money, political campaigns focus increasingly on trivial but emotionally volatile issues, diverting the attention of the electorate and masking the deep-seated problems that have real effect on their lives. The problems the candidates run on are ever more vacuous, loaded with ever more pabulum, and by general acknowledgement have less and less connection to the candidate's future office, behaviour in office. Once they have gained office, indeed, politicians quite commonly renege on their avowed campaign commitments. Instead of attending to the needs of those who cast their ballots for them, or advancing the policies they supported, they usually find it more rewarding to serve the moneyed interest groups that are eager to enhance their careers. Vast sums of money are required in order to wage an electoral campaign in the first place, and candidates are therefore dependent upon big donors to get themselves into office. To one degree or another, then, those who are elected to represent the people are likely to end up advancing policies that protect the interests of established wealth rather than those of the group they supposedly represent. Politicians make such choices not because they are bad people. Indeed, many of them originally enter public service with idealistic motivations. Rather, they make these choices because they have become part of a system of power interactions, whose imperatives have come to rule over them. This system of power interactions, let it be said candidly, is the state itself, dominated by big money. By functioning in the framework of this system, they come to share its aims of securing and maintaining a monopoly of power for an elite group of professionals, and of protecting and advancing the interests of the wealthy, rather than the more popular aims of empowering the many and redistributing wealth. The political parties, with their politicians, are associated in turn, not with necessarily groups, necessarily groups of high-minded citizens who share like political views. They are essentially hierarchically structured, top-down bureaucracies that are seeking to gain state power for themselves through their candidates. Their main concerns are the practical exigencies of faction, power and mobilisation, not the social well-being of the office holders' constituents, except insofar as professions of concern for the well-being of ordinary men and women attracts votes. But in no sense are these kinds of political parties either derivative of the body politic or constituted by it. Far from expressing the will of citizens, parties function precisely to contain the body politic, to control it and to manipulate it, indeed to prevent it from developing an independent will. However much political parties may be in competition with each other, and however much they could genuinely disagree on some specific issues, all of them share in assenting to the existence of the state and operating within its magisterial parameters. Every party that is out of power is in effect a shadow state waiting to take power, a state in waiting. To label this system politics is a gross misnomer. It should more properly be called statecraft professionalised, manipulative and immoral. These systems of elites and masses impersonate democracy, making a mockery of the democratic ideals to which they cynically swear fealty in periodic appeals to the electorate. Far from empowering people as citizens, statecraft presupposes the general abdication of citizen power. It reduces citizens to taxpayers and voters and constituents as if they were too juvenile or too incompetent to manage public affairs themselves. They are expected to function merely passively and let elites 
look out for their best interests. They are to participate in politics mainly on election days when voter turnout leaves le gives legitimacy to the system itself and on tax days of course when they finance it. The rest of the year the masters of statecraft would prefer that people tend to their private affairs and disregard the activities of politicians. Indeed, insofar as people slough off their passivity and begin to take an active interest in political life, they may create problems for the state by calling attention to the discrepancies between social reality and the rhetoric that it espouses. Politics as Direct Democracy Despite their interchangeability in conventional usage, politics is not at all the same thing as statecraft, nor is the state its natural domain. In past centuries, before the emergence of the nation-state, politics was understood to mean the activity of citizens in the public body, empowered in shared, indeed participatory, institutions. In contrast to the state, politics, as it once was, and as it could be again, is directly democratic. As advanced by libertarian municipalism, it is the direct management of community affairs by citizens through face-to-face -face democratic institutions, especially popular assemblies. In today's mass society, the prospect that people could manage their own affairs in such assemblies may seem woefully remote. Yet the times in history when people did so are nearer to us than we may think. Direct democracy was essential to the political tradition that Western societies claim to cherish. It lies at its very fountainhead. For the democratic political tradition originated not with the nation-state, but with the face-to-face -face democracy of ancient Athens, in the middle of the 5th century BCE. Politics, as it was first described in the writings of Aristotle, originally denoted a direct democracy, the very word politics is etymologically derived from polis, the ancient Greek word commonly mistranslated as city-state, for the public, participatory dimension of a community. In the Athenian polis, direct democracy attained a remarkable de degree of realisation, during one of the most astonishing periods in European, indeed world history, between the 8th and 5th centuries BCE, Athenian men and their spokesmen like Solon, Cleisthenes and Pericles, all three ironically renegade arist aristocrats, gradually dismembered the traditional feudal system that had been endemic to Homeric times and created on institutions that opened public life to every adult Athenian male. Power ceased to be the prerogative of a small, aristocratic stratum and became instead a citizen activity. At high water, the body politic of ancient Athens probably consisted of some 40,000 adult male citizens. Unfortunately, it excluded women, slaves and resident aliens, including Aristotle himself from political participation. The ancient Athenians had a strikingly different concept of political life from the one to which most people in today's Western democracies are accustomed. Today, we most often regard individuals as essentially private beings who sometimes find it necessary or expedient to enter public life, perhaps against their will, in order to protect or advance their private concerns. In the common present-day view, political participation is a, usually, unpleasant but nonetheless unavoidable extraneous burden that must be borne stoically before one returns to one's real life in the private sphere. By contrast, the ancient Athenians thought that adult Greek men are inherently political beings, that it is in their nature to consociate with one another in order to organise and manage their shared community life. Although their nature has both political and private components, the Athenians believed their distinctive humanity lies in the political component. As political beings, then, Greek men cannot be fully human unless they participate in organised community life. 
Without their participation, there is no community life. Indeed, no organized community and no freedom. Unlike the professionals who run the citadels of state power today and perform the machinations of statecraft, the ancient Athenians maintained a system of self-governance that was consciously amateur in character. Its institutions, especially its almost weekly meetings of the citizens' assembly and its judicial system, structured around huge juries, made it possible for political participation to be broad, general and ongoing. Most civic officials were selected from among the citizens by lot and were frequently rotated. It was a community in which citizens had a competence not only to govern themselves but to assume office when chance summoned them to do so. The direct democracy of Athens waned in the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War, and during the Roman Empire and afterward, the idea of democracy itself received a bad name as congruent with mob rule, especially from political theorists and writers who served imperial, kingly or ecclesiastical masters. But the notion of politics as popular self-management was never wholly extinguished. To the contrary, both the idea and its reality have persisted in the centuries that span those eras and ours. In the town centres of many medieval European communes, in colonial New England and in revolutionary Paris, among many other places, citizens congregated to discuss and manage the community in which they lived. Popes, princes and kings, to be sure, often developed overarching structures of power, but at the local level, in villages, towns and neighbourhoods, people controlled much of their own community life well into modern times. It must be conceded at the outset that history affords us no example of an ideal direct democracy. All of the notable instances of it, including ancient Athens, were greatly flawed by patriarchal and other oppressive features. Nevertheless, the best features of these instances can be culled and assembled to form a composite political realm that is neither parliamentary nor bureaucratic, neither centralised nor professionalised, but democratic and political. Here at the base of society, rich political cultures flourished. Daily public discussions bubbled up in squares, and parks, on street corners, in schools, cafes and clubs, wherever people gathered informally. Many of the neighbourhood plazas in ancient, medieval and renaissance cities were places where citizens spontaneously congregated, argued out their problems and decided on courses of action. These lively political cultures encompassed cultural aspects as well as explicitly political ones with civic rituals, festivals, celebrations and shared expressions of joy and mourning. In villages, towns, neighbourhoods and cities, political participation was a self-formative process in which citizens, by virtue of their ability to manage their community's pursuits, developed not only a rich sense of cohesion as a political body, but a rich individual selfhood. The Recreation of Politics With the rise and consolidation of nation-states, centralised power began to stifle this public participation, subjecting even distant localities to state control and terminating whatever autonomy they had hitherto enjoyed. At first this invasion was carried out in the name of monarchs, claiming a divinely sanctioned privilege to rule. But even after the concept of democracy became an object of passionate popular aspiration in the early 19th century, builders of republican states appropriated it as a gloss for their representative institutions, parliaments and congresses, and at the same time as a mantle to cloak their elitist, paternalistic and coercive nature. So it is that western nation-states today are routinely referred to as democracies, without a murmur of objection. With the creation of the welfare or social state, the state's powers, as well as its acceptability to the unwary, 
were even further expanded, assuming many of the social tasks for which communities had once been responsible on their own account. Still, in most parts of the European and American world, political life remained to some degree alive at the local level, as it does to this day. Direct democracy, of course, no longer exists in the ancient Athenian sense, yet even in communities that have been stripped of their former proud powers, formal and informal political arenas still abide. Civic associations, town meetings, forums, issue-oriented initiatives, and the like, as venues for face-to-face -face public processes. That is, even if direct democracy no longer exists, local public spheres do persist. To be sure, those remnant public spheres are themselves being gravely undermined today, as larger social forces corrode neighbourhood and community life. Economic pressures are forcing people to spend ever more of their time earning a livelihood which leaves them with less time to devote even to socialising or to family life, let alone to community affairs. The ethos of consumption in capitalist society draws men and women to give over much of what free time they do have to shopping, even as a form of recreation, or else to television watching, which primes them for more shopping. As family life becomes by necessity a haven in heartless world, political life comes to recede ever further from their grasp. In such a situation, neither political life nor family life can flourish. Thus, the very meaning of politics is gradually being forgotten. People in Western societies are losing their memory of politics as an active, vital process of self-management, while the innovated concept of citizenship, as voting and tax-paying and the passive receipt of state-provided services, is mistaken for citizenship itself. Deracinated from community, the individual is isolated and powerless, alone in a mass society that has little use for him or her as a political being. But if people lack apparent interest in public life, as so many commentators today lament, it may be because public life lacks meaning, that is, because it lacks substantial power. Instead of residing in local political realms, most decision-making power lies in the hands of the state. It did not get there by accident, or an act of God, or a force of nature. It was placed there by human agency. Builders of states appropriated it, compelling or seducing people to surrender their power to the larger edifice. But power, having been taken from the people, can also be recovered by them once again. It should come as no surprise that in all parts of the Euro-American world today, men and women are increasingly rejecting the existing party system and the paltry political role that has been doled out to them by the state. Alienation from what passes for political processes has become widespread witness massive voting abstentions, while politicians are distrusted far and wide. Even when pandered to extravagantly, citizens increasingly react with disgust and even hostility to electoral manipulation. Such revulsion against the processes of statecraft is a salutary trend, one on which a libertarian municipalist politics can build. The project of libertarian municipalism is to resuscitate politics in the older sense of the word, to construct and expand local direct democracies such that ordinary citizens make decisions for their communities and for their society as a whole. It is not, it should be understood, an attempt to expand citizen involvement in the processes of the republican state. It is not a call for greater voter turnout at the next election or citizen mobilisation in influencing legislation, write your representative, or even for expanding the use of tools like the initiative, referendum and recall with the intention of democratising the nation-state. Nor is it an attempt to replace winner-take-all voting systems, typical of the United States, Britain and Canada, 
with proportional representation, to allow members of small or third parties to gain office in accordance with the votes they receive. In short, it does not seek to embroider upon the democratic veils of the state by working for democratic reforms. Least of all, does it encourage men and women to actively participate in a structure that, all its masquerades to the contrary, is geared to control them. Libertarian municipalism, in fact, is antithetical to the state, since the state as such is unassimilable with community self-management and a thriving civic sphere. It is the aim of libertarian municipalism, rather, to revive the public sphere that is being precipitously lost, and to transform it into a political realm. It is to engender active citizens out of passive constituents and endow them with a political context in which they have meaningful choices. It aims to create this context by institutionalising their power in neighbourhood assemblies and town meetings. In a very radical sense, libertarian municipalism goes back to the very roots of politics, to revive direct democracy and expand it, along with the rational and ethical virtues and practices to support it.